So um, <laughs> welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. We are very happy about today's webinar uh, on everything NIH study section related. Not everything that happens in a study section stays there. Some things obviously have to, like discussions for specific grants, but we have two um, fantastic ISC members with us today to discuss everything that they can discuss about NIHs, uh, NIH uh, study sections. Uh, specifically, uh, we have with us Francine uh, Leiden, who is a professor in environmental epidemiology in the Department of Environmental Health and Epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. She's the past ISC president and currently an ISC NAC counselor. And uh, Dr. And George Thurston, who is a professor um, in the Department of Environmental Medicine and Population Health. He, uh, for many years, was the chair of the conference planning committee, and he's also the chair of our NAC policy committee right now. And they both have a very long um, experience in being uh, in study sections. So without uh, further ado, I will give uh, the room to you both. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll share my screen. So, so while can... he's setting that up, I just wanted to give us give you a little bit of background on our um, reviewing experiences. I mean, we have both and George can tell you more detail about him, but I've been on many, many ad hoc committees, but we also were both standing members of um, I, well, what is now CHSB, which is the cardio heart, what, what is it, cancer, heart, and sleep, sleep B, right. um, study section. I think George was on it before it, it became, when, before they combined cancer and cardiovascular. But I, I believe I took over when George rolled off, and now I'm now no longer on the commit standing member. So just right. Yes, I, I've served um, uh, uh, many times as well. You mentioned an ad hoc member, which is um, that NIH when they have a study section, they'll have uh, standing members who are at every meeting for um, for a couple of years. Uh, you attend. Huh? Yeah. Excuse me. Four years. Four years. <laughs> Goes by so fast. And, um, the, uh, and, and then, but usually before you um, get on as a standing member, they'll invite you uh, to be an ad hoc member or a temporary member. And then, um, you know, get, give you some experience and see whether, you know, how you do. And then uh, NIH may or may not invite you to be a standing member. Um, and I, even when you're a standing member, you can do ad hoc because they'll say, well, the committee has these capabilities, but we have a grant application that has a specific area that's not really covered by our expertise. So they'll bring in what they call ad hoc members to cover that particular grant. And this is a great opportunity, actually. Um, if anyone asks you to be an ad hoc member, say yes, because mm -hmm. that is the 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 way to become um, known to the, uh, the, the study sections science review officers, the SROs. Um, so that's, you know, just right off the bat, one piece of advice about uh, serving. It's a real opportunity and we can talk about that. Um, maybe I should show the next slide. Yeah, I mean, I was going to just reiterate what George said. I mean, oftentimes yeah. you're told as, as junior investigators that you have to learn how to say no. Um, but study section, Janice would probably like saying this is one of those things that you, if you can find the time to do, you should, is definitely worth doing and it is, should be a priority. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say not fine, but make time yeah. for, because exactly. you really have to make time. But um, anyway, so, so here are the topics that we decided to talk about, you know, why serve on study section? Why do it? Because uh, it is a fair amount of work. Uh, what do you do to prepare for the meeting? What to expect when you attend study section? And right now we're doing everything virtually, but usually um, you travel and meet lots of times in Washington, although they move it East Coast, West Coast. Um, and, um, and then how does a grant get scored? Just sort of the practical aspects. So Francine, maybe, you know, you go first. What, why okay. serve on study section? So why serve on study section? I mean, as as George already alluded to, the one reason is is because it's somebody's got to review these grants. You want people to review your grants, and so it's a it's a public service. 
Um, it's the same reason why you peer review um, uh, journal articles. So for that, you know, it, the system doesn't work if people don't do it. But another real reason for your own self and, you know, kind of the, the selfish reason to do it is it's a, an incredible way to learn. It's how mm -hmm. you can really see what grants look like, what's successful, what isn't, what people, you know, how people react to different things in a grant. Obviously, there's a lot of nuance to that. And it's a lot of, you know, review, can be reviewer specific or study section specific, but you get a real... In, you know, inside knowledge of how the whole system works. And it really, really can, I mean, I, my grants have improved immensely from the experience that I've had in the, you know, looking at other people's grants, understanding, you know, again, how reviewers react to different parts of the grant. And then the other thing, like jo George was saying, and particularly when you can meet in person, is it's an amazing opportunity to meet colleagues and to mm -hmm. meet people that you could potentially collaborate with or who could become mentors or um, you know, various other things, give you neat ideas or just even become friends. And um, I mean, the virtual has its advantage in that you, it's a less of a time commitment and you don't, you, know, you don't have to travel, you don't have to know that, you know, worry about whether your kid is in a play that evening or whatever and still be able to go. But you miss out on the opportunity of um, dinners and, and hallway conversations and I found that, you know, some of my best friendships and some even some collaborations have occurred in when I'm in conflict and we, you know, we're standing outside, you know, the all the people that are conflict in conflict, you can't talk about the grants, but you can talk about other things. And it's, I, 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 I don't know if Joel Kaufman has admitted to this or not, but he has, I mean, the reason that he applied to become um, the EHP um, editor in chief is because I was talking to him uh, at, you know, in conflict. We were in conflict in a, at one of these meetings, and I suggested that he apply for it. And that's what first got to be in his bonnet. So, you know, even if you're senior, it can be an opportunity to get some, mm -hmm. you know, new, new um, opportunities. So that's why I'm going to say to give George a chance. But I think you covered just about everything I was going to say. Um, <laughs> The, the uh, yeah, the conflict part, maybe we should just mention that. Um, and, and that is that um, there are grants that come up that you're not allowed to consider because, uh, for example, that the PI or people, uh, the key investigators are from your institution. So that's, it is very restrictive because people you have, you've never met, you know, you don't know, but they, NIH bends over backwards to avoid any sense of conflict of interest. And you do have to sign, you go through, well, I'm getting into how to prepare for the meeting, but, but so then what happens is you do spend a fair amount of time out in the hall um, and waiting while they go through a grant that you're not involved, you know, you're, you're not reviewing and you don't score it. Um, and uh, so, so that's how you do interact with the other people and you can find out, uh, you know, like, Friend said um, uh, that uh, what you know find mutual interests other than the the study section that's going on and uh, leads to some uh, research opportunities you might never have had. So it's it's really a positive uh, experience to do. So um, Audrey Gaskins just asked a question about what, what are the pros and cons of participating in a study section that might be outside of your area of interest? So if it's a study section that you wouldn't necessarily be sending your grants to, but they've tapped you because you have an expertise that they know that there are grants, some grants coming into it. Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind of the pros are that you get an opportunity, you know, maybe you might find that that is a study section that could be potentially of interest to you that you would not have thought of before. Um, you still have the opportunity to learn amazing things and to make collaborators that are outside of your field. Um, yeah, and you learn things. You mm -hmm. learn things from um, the discussions and from, uh, you know, reading the grants. You have the grants that you're assigned uh, and that's where your focus is uh, on the ones, especially if you're the first reviewer, then you carry um, a lot of the weight uh, in terms of discussing the details of the grant if people ask questions. But there, you're, you, you're certainly um, 
able to and probably should, you know, as much as possible, read the other grants um, and then be able to con comment on them. But then you learn um, things in other areas. And so it's really interesting. I mean, you're, you're interested in science, right? Well, so there's lots of science and leading edge science that people are proposing. So it's, it's a real learning experience. Uh, you know, at this, once you get out past your doctorate, no one is trying to educate you very much. <laughs> You're educating other people. And these are opportunities where you can learn things. So um, that's, that's a real positive of it. And I, I, the only con I can think of is, you know, whether you really, really feel it's just way outside of your, your interests that it's, um, but I think that that's just rarely going to happen that, you know, no matter what, there's going to be some nugget that you can learn from it. So I can't really think of an obvious con. Right. And the other thing is that NIH does, I mean, I found, you know, they are aware of the reviewing that you're doing across the, uh, the board. And if you've got a reputation of being a good reviewer in this particular study section, they're going to know that and tap you for another study section. Yeah. So maybe we should um, move on to uh, what do you do to prepare for the meeting? And um, so what's going to happen is that you would be asked to serve on the study section. Um, and we'll go later. Later, we have a slide for people. Normally, it's kind of um, a little bit of a mysterious process, but, but that, that the people at NIH become aware, perhaps by your serving ad hoc, that you would be a good reviewer and you've got publications, you have an NIH grant that's usually um, required to, to be a standing member. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Janice, but- No, nope. um, you're right. Yeah, so, so getting your, after you get your NI, first NIH grant, then probably someone's gonna say, hey, what about this person? They just got an NIH grant and they'll look at your background and where you might fit in, that kind of thing. And then they'll, if, if they see, um, Enough there, they'll ask you. Um, but that's usually like you're, moved, you're further along in your career when that happens. But they do have a process now we'll talk about later um, for new, new, newer, younger investigators uh, to apply to be considered, which is, which is a new thing because you could never call up and say, I want to be on a study section. You know, that it would be, it really is more, you know, they're assessing uh, your, your publications and your experience and so on. And then, coming up sort of like you know the nobel prize committee comes to people and say oh you know you're going to serve it's not exactly the same but <laughs> <laughs> but uh same concept oh, where they come out of the blue and contact you yeah um, it has a database if i could yeah, yeah just a, something Please. has a database that um allows sros to see who has applied for grants who has been uh, awarded a grant, and then also what study sections uh, you have uh, served on. And it goes back, gosh, probably 15, 20 years, uh, at least for your study section uh, work. So that's a good source for us. And even if you've applied, some institutes are, are less stringent, but NIEHS is fairly stringent in that we want people who have been awarded a grant, but some, some people, you know, you could go into this database and see that they've applied three or four times, but just haven't gotten it awarded yet. Um, and sometimes those people will be asked uh, to, you know, to be a reviewer. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you for that, uh, filling mm -hmm. that in, because you know better than we do exactly how the, the whole system works. Um, so preparing for the meeting. So you're asked to be on the study section, um, and let's say probably ad hoc the first time. And um, then you will be asked to review a, a limited number of grants. There, there might be dozens of grants, and usually are dozens of grants, and uh, that have to be covered uh, in a day or two. Um, and so you, but you will not be assigned all those and you'll be, there's um, the, you'll be assigned either a primary first, second or third reviewer. So there's three re reviewers for every grant, although everybody on the committee votes and reviews uh, and listens to the discussion before they vote. 
Um, the, the three primary, you know, the first, second, and third reviewers are really the ones with most of the responsibility for, for discussion and uh, going through the criteria we'll talk about uh, soon um, as to how you score a grant. Um, and so you have to, once you've been asked to do that, then you have a certain amount of time to review it and write up your report and then a date ahead of the meeting you submit it to electronically and uh, your review and your scores, your preliminary scores. Uh, and then they, um, once all three primary, secondary, tertiary reviewers post it, then you can see what the others reviewed. You can look at theirs and, and then you can uh, think again about your scores and what you wrote because sometimes someone will bring up something you didn't think of. And then you'll say, hmm, okay, that's a really strong argument. So maybe my score, I'll bump up a little bit. And your write-up has to reflect why you're, you know, uh, have that score. That, that's one of the biggest things that's hard to do is to make sure that your review matches your scores. Because I don't know about anybody else, but when I get a review back and I don't think it matches the scores, then I'm yeah. upset, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's <laughs> something you have to build through. And I, I want to add, you do have an opportunity to revise your text after the meeting, right. which I think is where sometimes it gets, there, there's some falling in the cracks there, because I think that's probably likely where <laughs> some people, sometimes you're like, wait, the score does not reflect what this person said. Right. Um, or the summary, you know, sometimes the, well, what will happen is that the chair will write up a summary based on what they heard in the discussion. And uh, then if there's some differences with, from what they heard during the discussion of what you wrote, in other words, you said something different or you added something, then, then, then that can be sort of uh, bother uh, people about the review. So it's important to then go back afterwards when you have this window of time for a few days after the meeting and um, make sure that it really reflects what you said at the meeting and, and, and what, you, what your score was. Um, but we've, we've moved on uh, from the- The one thing I wanna just add about preparing. So I, in my experience, I've usually reviewed about eight to 10 grants a cycle. Um, I usually, we usually have about four or five weeks to, to do it. Um, the other thing is before you're assigned the grants, you have an opportunity to go through the list of all the grants that are, that are being reviewed in that study section to see if you have any conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. And the conflicts of interest, to be honest, can be either, like George mentioned, one is, you know, people who work in your same institution. There's also obvious, the obvious ones, you know, people that you was either your mentor or your mentee, um, people who you've published with, and I think it's, it's the last three years. Um, three years three years. One thing that is very, I, one thing that I will say, I think my SROs have really been, I drive them crazy because sometimes there are people like there's a list of all the, there's the co-investigators, all the investigators, there's a list of letter writers. So people who write letters of support, sometimes you're in conflict with those people as well, even if they're actually not participating in the grant. And I invariably miss something. And then in the, I get assigned a grant and I'm like, I actually can't review this. So that's something you have to really, I recommend double check and triple check. So you do it once and then they hopefully you've found all your conflicts, particularly, unfortunately, working at Harvard, this is a problem. I have tend to be in a lot of conflict. Um, and also people who are very collaborative and work with lots of different groups ha run into this problem. Yeah. But, um, and then after you're assigned the grants, double check again while it's still early so they can reassign the grant to somebody else. Yeah. And the, the conflict of interest is a big thing with NIH, um, and it's important. Uh, and you do it before, during, and after. You, you have multiple, yeah. Yeah, so you keep checking and checking. You know, you and I will say one thing that's a little frustrating is that I think, you know, because of the, you know, it's your field, right? It's the ones that you feel like that you're really mo sometimes most interested in and really know a lot about are the ones that, mm -hmm. or at least for me, that I'm that I'm in conflict. I mean, obviously I am able to, there are other grants that I'm totally qualified to, to review and those are what I review, but there's others that, you know, I, it would be really cool to be able to review them, but understand mm -hmm. the conflict, I can't. Yeah, so, so then um, there, um, you know, so they give you a form and we'll go through the scoring criteria that are on the form. And that's important uh, 
from two perspectives. One is, you know, when you're sitting on study section, this gives you sort of the guidance as to how to go about reviewing it, which is really helpful. On the other hand, you know, if you're writing an application, the questions that are asked, um, you know, you're writing an application, you should say, well, have I answered these questions? Because mm -hmm. if you haven't answered those questions, then the reviewer is going to say, well, I don't know exactly what the impact is because they never really said anything about that. Um, so, so, you know, that's again, part of the learning experience. Um, so anything else on preparing beforehand? Francine? I don't think so, I think. Okay, so we can go what to expect at study section. And I did have a slide, um, let's see. Um, yeah, the next slide on the do's and don'ts. Yeah, the do's and don'ts. This is, uh, you know, borrowed uh, from a longer document um, that was done by Bob Weller, who I don't know, but, but the, found the document really helpful when it was shared with me. Uh, don't use the word fund. <laughs> it's considered the F word. That's and, right. <laughs> so, and, and the reason is because, you know, uh, it's, we studies, program officials decide on the funding, not study section. So all we're doing is evaluating the science. And there is a budget. And, and at the end of the process, after it's scored, that can be discussed whether there's something way out of whack or not. But basically, during the discussion, when you're reviewing it ahead of time, when you're reviewing it on the day, just don't worry about the money because that'll be sorted out later. If, if it right. gets a score and there's program relevance, then, it, then they'll get to the funding question much later. Okay, program relevance. What is program relevance? Uh, program relevance is the uh, funding agencies, what they're interested in. So it's always good to uh, find out what the agency you're applying to is interested in seeing funded because personally, you know, I've gotten, I've, I've done the gamut of scores and I've gotten like a third percentile, which should definitely get funded and have them say, you know what, we're not interested in that topic. I know the study section loved it, but that we don't really need, we, you know, they sort of have a, um, it's like sort of like playing cards. You know, you need certain cards. You've got this straight and you're missing one card. Those other cards, no matter how good, it could be an ace. They don't help because they're not the card they need. So they're looking at their portfolio and they can say, on the other hand, I've had grants that have scored way above the supposed cut line and had them reach out and say, you know, we're really interested in this question and no one else has a grant on this. So we want you, we're going to give you the money, you know, not mm -hmm. like 25th percentile, things like that. I was gonna say, I don't, it probably wasn't way above. It must've just been no. a little above. <laughs> well, today it would be way above. Back yeah, then it wasn't above. that far. 25th percentile would be way above uh, usually. But anyway, it's, you know, so you can be below or above the supposed cut line um, and, uh, and, so, and still get funded or not funded. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, but don't consider budget and reviewing the science. We sort of go over that before. Um, yeah, don't begin your comments. You know, and this is just sort of, wait, this is not my field or I don't know why this application was assigned to me. You know, um, that is, uh, you know, that's, first of all, saying you don't really know what you're talking about. So mm -hmm. move on, go to the next person because I, I don't know anything about this. Yeah. Um, when in fact, you probably did a lot of work to understand it and, you know, so on. Your own argument. Also, the SRO has picked you to do this. So you're sort of uh, criticizing the SRO and, you know, they do the best they can with what they've got to work with, you know. Um, so, uh so don't do that. Um, do be prepared to discuss your assigned grant applications briefly without reporting. Uh, everybody sort of gets, like the third reviewer a lot of times will feel like they ought to say something. So, because, you know, the first and the second reviewers did such a good job and now, you know, that basically was everything they were gonna say. So then they repeat things and no, mm -hmm. don't waste time. Just no. discuss, be brief. It's very, uh it's it's okay to say I have nothing new to add. Uh, that'll be appreciated. <laughs> yes, by everyone else in the room. There's yes. a tendency to, to want to show that you actually did review the grant. Um, so try and overcome that. And do listen to the views of others and be willing to moderate your own views 
appropriately and um, accept that your views will not always prevail. So play nicely is I guess the bottom line on that. Um, and, uh, you know, respect other people's opinions. And, you know, I know that in your life, most of the time you're right and everyone else is wrong, but here, <laughs> just be open-minded. Um, the one, one thing I want to add, which I, we didn't actually prepare a slide on, but kind of just like the, 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 the rhythm of a study section. So that like George has mentioned is that there are three reviewers and what happens is that they pre-score, they, they report their scores before, before you get to study section and the SRO then averages those scores and ranks them. And what um, was happening until about a year ago is what would happen is that then they would take, you would usually do the new investigators first and you would only talk about the first, the top 50%. So the ones with the 50% 50, 50 that had the lowest scores of the new investigators. And until a year, about a year ago, you would do those in order. So with the best grants first, or the ones that are pre-scored best first yeah. and then going down. And starting, I, I think this is pretty universal, but at least yeah. in the study section I was in, is that they started randomizing that. Mm -hmm. I think it's been really interesting because previously you would have, you know, you'd be, you kind of get fatigued by the time you were getting to the ones that had the not quite as good scores and the, t the discussion would get very different. And so you were spending a lot of time discussing the ones that everybody actually already liked and there wasn't as much to talk about. And then to be honest, because people really liked it. And sometimes what happens with this, the more discussion, sometimes the worse the scores would tend to get as opposed to better. Right. And because you start to find things to get to nitpick about or whatever. So I think this randomization has been, is a good thing. I, I like it. And then you would get to the next round group would be the, the RO1s from the established investigators. And then again, you take the top 50%, the ones with the 50% lowest score, the 50, you know, 50% with the lowest scores, and those would be randomized. And it is really funny what goes on in your head with the difference with it being randomized. Cause I know I used to be thinking, okay, now we're getting into the fours and I'm just like, why are we even bothering at this point? And you're starting to bump up against, you know, plane flights and things like that. But now with it randomized, um, you know, sometimes you're now getting into the ones that are, that were given ones and twos in the first place. And, you know, you want to make sure that those get talked about and discussed and, and yet you also don't necessarily need to, you know, the ones and twos, there's not as much to talk about. There shouldn't be because they got ones and twos in the first place. Mm -hmm. It should be like, this is good. We like this. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. And, um, and then the R21s are usually last or the R15s and there are other things that come up in the, in that study section. Yeah. Um, so, but in many ways, it, it's the ones that are, uh, that have a diversity of scores that are the most interesting because somebody says, this is really great grant. Someone says, this is terrible. And then you get a lot of good discussion and occasionally it changes. I, you know, I was on a study section very recently. And of course I remember this one because, uh, because I, I prevailed, you know, the um, <laughs> naturally, but it was one where someone gave it a really low score and, and I gave it a high score and we went through the discussion and I made a point and they went, hmm, okay. And they went from the lowest to the highest score. <laughs> so, so that can happen. So that's why you should keep an open mind, even the ones that are on the margin, because someone might bring up something that is compelling that you just didn't think about. And there's um, also the opportunity to rescue grants. So if a grant doesn't make the original half, you know, 50% cut, yeah. you are given an opportunity at the beginning to say, look, I, you know, I know this didn't score as high as everybody or as low as everybody else's, but we, I, there's some really important points that I think some of the other reviewers missed. And I really want to be, talk about it. And sometimes those can be a little frustrating because it's like, you know, there were good reasons why it wasn't in the 50%. But sometimes it does give an opportunity for people to think about some aspects that, um, you know, they weren't aware of or some really interesting points. So there did is I mean, an opportunity to rescue grants. Did I miss this or did you mention that, you know, you know that you don't discuss every grant? You only right. discuss I think I said that. The, did you, only, you say that? Yeah, you only discuss half of them. Yeah, the top half, the, uh, based on the preliminary scores they go through, and then you, you just discuss. But you, like you say, you can pull one up and, and discuss it, even when, um, when and, and in fact, that's exactly what happened with that grant that, that shifted so much. I hope I'm not saying too much, but, but <laughs> the, the, uh, 
it was not to be discussed. I said, let's discuss it. Then the points came out and the person went from worst score to, to highest score. Mm -hmm. so that's, um, that's gratifying when you can do that. When you really think it's a good grant and, and other people didn't appreciate it um, or didn't yeah. get it, um, you can make a difference that way. Um, so we, George and I were talking about this last night when we were preparing about kind of like, is it a good thing or a bad thing to have people that are really in your field in the on the study section? And I know one of the things that was really frustrating to me 10 years ago, even I was probably before George was was at, I think George was the first one that was really like finally like, OK, air pollution advocate, somebody who's really in this understands the environment. And I think that that has a real big advantage to have people that are on mm -hmm. in your field, even if they're not the ones that can necessarily review your grants because of conflict, but they they kind of can have an ability to explain to the other people in the study sections the importance of your field and can really right. advocate for the field. Right. The one disadvantage I will say, and then just to be completely honest, is that those people often know the real problems with your grant <laughs> in a way that the people that are not in your field know and they might take yeah. it more at face value. So it can, like sometimes you can get like the harshest reviews from the people that are in your field because they really can hold you to task about a lot of things yeah. that other people might not be able to do. They know where the bodies are buried. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. But I, I think in but the I end, would, you know, I wouldn't use the word advocate, but but I would say I do think it's you know because I, well, okay, we'll use air pollution as a random example. Mm -hmm. That people say, well, everybody knows air pollution is bad for you. Why are we even discussing funding a grant on this? And you know, uh, and you have to say, well, this is this grant is important. This is a question that's unresolved about this, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, it has this import, as you know, they talked about in the significance. And so, you know, this is something that uh, is important um, to consider, uh, not to fund necessarily, but to consider. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so, maybe educate is the better yeah. word, because you're really educating, you know, your colleagues about what the specific kinds of work that you do in the yeah. areas that you that you research. And I think that that that's it. So the upshot is, I think it's a more of a gain than a loss of having the people that really can understand the importance of what these these grants are. Yeah, that's the thing. Maybe we didn't mention was that the study. There is no environmental study section. You know, this is inter, this is right. you know International Society for Environmental Epidemiology, but there is no no environmental study section. There, it's based really on diseases. Um, so that there's cancer and there's uh, cardiac and then there's respiratory. I've also served as a standing member on that one as well, uh, the respiratory uh, in the past. Um, so then, you know, and the people on those are real experts in those diseases, but they're not necessarily, um, and, you know, I've been working on this at NYU, trying to educate physicians about about environment and environmental health. I teach a selective course on that at NYU, but most medical schools don't have that for their, uh, and a lot of the people on these study sections are physicians, um, and uh, which is appropriate, but um, they don't always under, you know, appreciate the environmental causes of the disease that they know so much about. And so that's, you know, we're kind of wedging in there and educating them about uh, environmental health. Um, and uh, so that's, I also would love to have a question on the medical boards, but that's another question, another point. Someone asked, how long does it average take to review a grant? You go first. How long does it take for you? I didn't want to answer this question. It depends. It depends a lot. And, um, you know, I, some, I mean, four hours is probably the minimum. Um, it depends on how well, you know, whether I need to, whether I feel I need to do any extra research in order to kind of back up kind of what, what people are claiming. Um, and it depends, I'll be honest, it's a lot, this is terrible, but it's a lot easier to, re to review a bad grant than an, a good grant. Because with a, with a grant that, and luckily I don't get, I mean, luckily for the field, I don't get many bad grants, but bad grants I can do pretty quickly because I know what the problems are right away. And I can really, um, I can do it pretty, like I said, pretty fast. The ones that where I think, hey, this is a really good grant, and I want to just see if I can find, figure out if there's something that I'm missing, then I have to find I have to do a little bit of extra research. I have to think about it a little bit more. It can take longer. 
Yeah, I would agree. I would say I usually budget uh, for to be able to do one to two grants in a day. At yeah. best, two, probably more often a day. Yeah. And, and that's because these people have put in, you know, I know, I've, I've written grants, you do all this work, and then, you know, it's really incumbent on you to do the, the work, especially, you know, especially if you're first reviewer, you know. Yeah. I but, definitely spend more time at first reviewer grants than I do when I'm the third reviewer. But um, again, right. it really depends on whether it's something that's, I feel I need to do any extra research. I will say one thing that I find kind of interesting, this is just a little, I, we don't really want to talk too much about grantsmanship, but you know, when you're writing your significance section and you say, you know, you're putting in all these references about how like nobody else has done this before. Like I, sometimes I feel that I need to go back and see, is it really true that nobody else has done this before? I mean, I don't know that you just nitpicked and, you know, pick the ones that are, um, yeah. that didn't, that prove your point. And so I don't really, I, you know, it's interesting. There was, an, there was a um, survey from NIH a little bit while ago asking if you actually look at other, do literature searches when you're, do, when you're reviewing a grant. And I mean, the answer is it depends for me, but like particularly when people make really strong statements like that, I do feel mm -hmm. I need to do due diligence and see, is it really mm -hmm. true that nobody's done this before? And, um, you know, I don't check every reference. Obviously I would, mm -hmm. it would take me, out weeks to review a single grant if I did that. But I think that that's, that's something that can also add to the time. I do also find that I do a first draft of all my grants and then I go back and redo them because as I've kind of been thinking more and gotten my head more into the process, I find I want to rewrite the first ones particularly. And for me anyway, I'm, I, every, every time I do this, I'm like, I'm going to pace it better. But I have always found that I just need to get into a zone with with um, reviewing these. And that's the way I operate, unfortunately, because it's not quite as satisfying. <laughs> okay, so maybe we should move on. Um, yeah. Because how does a grant get scored? And, and these are, this is um, what we've got here is what NIH provides to the reviewers for uh, doing the critique. And, and if you're writing a grant, look at these because if you don't answer these questions, then the reviewer can't answer them. Um, so I don't know, you want to start Francine? Well, I don't want to read the whole slide, but basically just so that you all understand that there is an overall impact. That's kind of the first summary that the reviewer gives. And this is really about whether you think that this project is, could exert a sustained powerful influence on the research field. And so, you know, it's really, and this is where you summarize what your big, you know, the score driving factors that, that you put into this. And sometimes, you know, you can feel a disconnect, to be honest, where you think that, you know, wow, this is a really cool grant and they are doing everything right, but I'm just not sure it's needed. And I'm not sure it's going to have that much impact. And you can, this is a place to kind of put that summary together. Like, you know, you can be somebody could be doing this great research that, you know, it, it scientifically sound, but is it really, do you as a reviewer feel it's really that important? Yeah. Or on the flip side, it can, I have been in study section where people have said, you know, I know there are a few flaws in, in this grant, but I think it's a really important question. And so we need to figure out and how to advise these grant writers about how to make this more compelling because it's really important that this work get done. Yeah, I, I think that's an advantage that we have uh, in environmental epidemiology because what we're doing is so directly relevant to public health and to policy setting. And, uh, you know, if you get down to molecular um, kinds of, and, and it's all important because we need to understand mechanisms, right? Um, but to then say, you know, and I get this also from like uh, the public relations people at NYU, because they say, we love your research because people understand what you're talking about. You know, it relates to their everyday lives. Whereas the fact that this person found this new um, molecular connection or change or, you know, me mechanism, you know, the public doesn't really know what, what that useful for. And you can have the same problem in study section that people don't know whether this really will advance. Well, anyway, so, so that kind of major contribution and also uh, help, you know, in terms of medical care, if it's gonna make a difference how physicians might uh, treat patients or uh, deal with patients, then that's an important thing. And I will say sometimes when I'm reviewing a grant that is, um, 
you know, slightly outside of, you know, I've been put on it because I have an, a certain expertise for a certain aspect of it. But if the overall gist of the grant is something that I don't necessarily know how, what kind of impact on the field, I'm not sure how effective this is, but sometimes what I do is I actually try to Google that and see what kind of more lay people are saying and what's out there, you know, cause you're not gonna necessarily find that in PubMed, but you may see it more on the internet. Like are people talking about this particular kind of, you know, molecular something or other, or this particular treatment or something. And I don't know, I don't know if it's, if it's that help, been that helpful necessarily, but I found that that's one way for me to educate myself on that aspect of the grant. Because oftentimes you're put on a grant as a reviewer because you know about one part of it, but you don't, you know, and that's what you're providing expertise on. And so to just get more of a general sense of what that yeah. is, where that is. One of the key phrases is modifiable risk. If, if, okay, you can find this big influence, but if we can't change it, if there's nothing we can do about it, then it's probably not as strongly impactful. So modifiable risks are, are really important to uh, evaluate. And also if you're writing an application to, to, to note that this is a modifiable risk and we could actually change this and improve public health. Okay, okay. go on. Yes, move on. We're here. running out of time. I know. Um, yeah, we're really running out of time. <laughs> the significance. Well, maybe, you know, again, we don't want to read everything. Yeah. It, it's, it's related to impact, um, you know, and how successful completion of the aims change the concepts, method, technologies, treatment, uh, preventive interventions. Um, so, um, uh, you know, the significance score should be driven solely by importance of the question um, and so this, you know, it, sometimes it's hard to separate, um, maybe I'll put Janice on the spot. How do you separate significance from impact? Uh, basically, I think your last bullet uh, says a lot for the importance of the, the question uh, that you're, you're trying to answer. And the overall impact sort of takes into consideration not only the, the project itself, but are the investigators capable of, of doing what they say they're doing? Okay. Uh, is the approach, is there a better approach, more um, recent approach that should be used uh, instead of an old, tried, proven, there may be some advantages to one or the other. And also the environment, um, you know, are they somewhere that can house the people and the project and the uh, execution of that project. So it's more of, more of a global overview of all these five criteria. But definitely, I mean, people will tell you what drives your score, and most people will say approach or right. uh, innovation or, you know, significance is, is good too. Um, I have found that invest the criterion of investigators, hardly anyone is, is you know, uh, deemed on that because nobody wants to, you know, to say anything bad about anybody. Um, so that's probably not as score driving um, as, you know, as the approach. And I, I mean, just to make sure it gets discussed, I mean, I, Janice, I'd love to hear your opinion on the environment. That always feels like a, a throwaway to me. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things that come out in the environment are you know, they're located at different universities. Um, this one has a strong program for this, but this one doesn't. Um, almost everybody gets a, a one or two on an environment. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's hard. It's hard to say unless you know the, the program. Mm -hmm. And usually the people who know the program and where they're gonna be done uh, have a tendency to score much better. Um, if your if your project is going to be done, um, you know, say we have a lot of projects that are done, you know, in the United States and then you know outside or foreign, and so the environment there is questioned probably a little more um, severely. But you know, we have very long term you know studies um, outside the United States and and those that that will bring it up if they're if the study's been ongoing for several years so they're they're just lots of um, points but generally the environment 
is not a, you know, a, a, a score driving kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. and not a, not a break well, deal breaker. That's what I was well, trying to say. We cover investigators, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I would say the one thing about that um, is if it's a, a new investigator or a younger investigator, early stage investigator, then uh, yes, do they have an experienced collaborator? So that's important uh, that, that I've seen. I've said, well, this person's inexperienced, but you know, I know that this person that they're working with is one of the leaders in the field and they will not go astray on this because they've got this person. So that's, you know, you look for that, but if they don't, then in the review, you say, well, this would be strengthened if you had a, a uh, right. Another thing that often comes up in investigators is, is um, sometimes reviewers feel that there is, there's either too many of like, you've got five environmental epidemiologists on there, why do you need five? Or you don't have somebody. And, and I mean, I know that a number of grants I review, you know, sometimes people are doing, let's just use air pollution for an example, and they're, but they're not air pollution experts and they, they don't have anybody on the grant that can give that environmental expertise. And so I will, comment on that or oftentimes people another one that comes up a lot is people often feel that the that there aren't enough biostatisticians on or right. certain expertise is missing a little bit so it's kind of there's a problem where people seem to get dinged on here is either that there's too many of one type of person and why do you really need all these investigators or that some reviewers have pointed set been concerned that there aren't that there's a certain little expertise that's missing on the team. Yeah. So uh, yeah, biostatistician is essential for most of the grants that mm -hmm. we review. Um, and um, this is probably why biostatisticians are so well funded. But <laughs> another point. Um, innovation, we kind of touched on this, but you know, is this new? Um, is there something that, you know, um, it's, is it just incremental or is there something really a new insight that's going to be uh, uh, and something new that's tried a new, uh, a new approach uh, methodology or intervention that hasn't been done before. So, um, and yeah, novel and innovative are probably the most overused words in applications. Um, <laughs> and then you got to defend it. So yeah. use it sparingly. I make this mistake myself. Sometimes you say it's innovative and then someone finds where one person has done it and that's, then you're dead. <laughs> Anything else, Francine? No, I don't think so. I mean, sometimes people feel that, that it's not particularly innovative, but really important. I mean, it can still be important if, it's, yeah. if you're using standard methodologies. Um, but... So, so appro approach. Now, I, I've been told that if you go through and you look at all the grants and you look at the overall score and you look at the approach, the, the approach is most correlated, most predictive. So I that too. <laughs> that, yeah, the, yeah, of what the actual score is. So you can have all these nice things, but if your approach is not sound, then you're mm -hmm. dead. Um, and so, you know, not completely, but, but pretty much. Um, so this is the, really the foundation of the grant and uh, needs to, you know, dot all the I's and cross all the T's. Um, I think one thing that also can be frustrating in the approach, because this is one place where the reviewer really can give a lot of good bullet points on what the weaknesses are of why they gave it a worse score. And sometimes they don't. And that can be, as I know, as a recipient of the scores, that's really frustrating because you're telling me my reproach isn't any good, but why not? And so what do I do to make it better? And I remember this is kind of, I remember talking to John Samet back, you know, before when they, we had the 25 page grants and the reviews mm -hmm. were much, much longer. And he talked about how when he did a review, it was really important. He felt it was his opportunity to really help the investigator and really give them a lot of, to give them a lot of feedback about, uh, and it's primarily probably was about in the approach because that's what he, you know, he's an expert epidemiologist, right? And he knew a lot of stuff about that. And he felt it was his opportunity to do that. Reviews are much shorter now. And also we don't have 25 pages. You know, I looked back at a 25 page grant and I was like, oh my God, what did we put in those grants? It's so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so repetitive and so much detail. And it's like, really? I mean, so glad that we went to the 12 pages. Um, 
but I mean, I think this is really one thing that's really important as a reviewer that to, if you're going to give a score in the approach that, you know, this, that you really make sure that your strengths and weaknesses and the weaknesses are the most important part. I, to be honest, when I'm looking at a review of mine, you know, not when I'm writing it, but when I'm looking at a review of mine, I don't look at the strengths. I want to know what the weaknesses were because I want to know what I can fix. The strengths are yay. They, they appreciated that. But the weaknesses are what's really important here. And so as a reviewer, it's, I think it's, I really feel it's your obligation that if you're going to say something is wrong with the approach, you've got to tell the, the, the um, investigators why, what's wrong yeah. with it. Well, I'm going to also say what the strengths are. I mean, yeah, that's no, the strengths are important to mention as well. But I think that, you know, I often, some, I found myself used to get bogged down on the strengths and write a lot of details about the strengths. And then I was like, you know, do I, I, it's important to tell them what the main points of the strengths are, but I think that the weaknesses is where you really need to yeah. focus in the but I, I remember being at a study section and one, the primary reviewer, the review was scathing and said all the things that they found wrong with it and nothing good. And, and I said, you know, the idea here is to tell the person applying you know, how to improve their grant, not to get them to quit science. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm very sorry to interrupt, but maybe start wrapping within the next yeah, five minutes. I think we're almost done here. Yeah, we are. Environment we talked about, that's yeah. Um, yeah. important, but not critical. And then the scoring. Um, so it's a scale of, of one to nine. Um, and we used to have, you know, 100 to 900, and that it's was- 900, I think. Huh? 500, wasn't it 500. just five, right? And then before that, it was 100 to 900. Yeah. And maybe, I'm probably right. older than you guys, so maybe. when I was- No, I remember, yeah. yeah. I, I've given people 700, 800. Yeah. Like if, if they- so one to nine, and then you, you know, you multiplied it by 100, so. Yeah. And, yeah. and that was much better, in my opinion, yeah. okay? But for what it's worth. And you could give much. half points. You could do four and a half. I would love to. Yeah, I would love to be able to do 1.5 and 2.5. Me too. Anyway, this is I the way it is. So, so live with it because, um, and the probably the big thing, you know, the high, medium, and low, the thing is uh, it's important if you're going to serve on study section to as much as possible spread out your scores. Because obviously, you know, everybody's putting in their best ideas. And so if you score them one, two, all one, two, threes, then it's almost impossible to figure out who's the best and who's the worst. You know, you need to have, so you need to actively um, balance it. And this gives, this is from NIH, but you know, um, and they give you an idea uh, where, you know, it's, uh, my, around the middle, you know, it's addressing a problem of high importance, but there are weaknesses that bring it down and problem or a moderate importance with, with no weaknesses. So, you know, if, you, if you're identifying weaknesses, then don't give it a, a one, you know, I think. I definitely don't give it a one. <laughs> yeah, and also, um, you know, the, the adjectives that you use should fit the score. So if you say it's an outstanding application and give it a seven or something, that's not. Yeah, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, I think one of the hardest things is also as a um, recipient of reviews is that, you know, they're really, so I, I have been told, you know, now is that you really should start with a five. Like that should be your, right. the way that you go in is you're thinking this is a five and then have the, and then have the investigator convince you that it should be something you know, between a one and a four. And I think that's really been hard for us as investigators to, to get our hand, heads around because you get a, you get a four and you're like, oh my God, they thought it was horrible. And actually that's not, they think it was horrible. They think it was, it was actually pretty good. But, um, and I think that that is hard as, as a reviewer because you think that and you're like, oh my God, you know, I like this grant, but I'm giving it a four. And uh, that should actually be, Almost the default score. The five, yeah. That's where, so that's what they said. Start with five, and then that's for their sort of typical application that you get. And, you know, they're all pretty good, right? But that, that's, and then if it's below average or above, and, and, you know, of course, as you do it more, then you see a broader range of applications and 
you're more able to uh, mm -hmm. discriminate out and spread out. Your and this again is why it's so valuable to sit on study section because you get to see this mm -hmm. range of applications and you can understand better how yours fits in. Yeah. And, and anyway, if you give everything a, a one or a two, you will hear from the SRO. They will, <laughs> they will send you a reminder that it's important to spread out your scores. So avoid that email. <laughs> anyway, you may, let me put it that way. You may. I will say I very, very, very rarely give a one. It is not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Be and then if you do give it a one, you better be ready to defend it, you know, yeah, to yeah. your score, defend the score, not the grant. Um, okay, so last thing, um, we thought we should mention this because a lot of the people who are, you know, who are going to be listening to this are people who are just starting out and want to know. And there is now, and Janice might be able to fill this in better than I can, but there, for early career scientists, there's actually a way to put in your information and have them consider you uh, for, for a mm -hmm. early career reviewer. Mm -hmm. Anis, you want to add something to that? Well, and this is for um, CSR. Uh, different ICs don't really, may not have a similar program. What's I know in the NIEHS, we pull in people who, um, you know, want to be career uh, or reviewers, and we ask them to send us their CVs. We look at their funding history. Uh, and then when it comes time to assign applications, I assign them as reviewer three with the more established uh, reviewers and, you know, and I'm available to handhold, you know, through the process. Um, but I know that um, there are other institutes that don't have any um, sort of defined program. Um, and I know we don't, uh, we don't suggest, well, we suggest people to go to this um, ECR program, but, um, you know, we don't do it ourselves. Oh, okay. um, what does CSR stand for again? Uh, Center of Scientific Review. Okay. Just so, because we use... And then know. the ICs are the, you know, NIEHS, NIAID, NIA, you know, the, the 27 centers and uh, institutes. So each one has their own, like NIEHS only has one study section and most of our reviews are SEPs or special um, emphasis panels. Uh, and so there is a little bit of difference in, in those, two, um, those two ways of reviewing. I would like to thank very, very much uh, Dr. Francine London, uh, George Thurston and um, Dr. Uh, Janice Allen for uh, presenting here. This was all, at least to me, but I hope also to everybody in the audience, very, very useful uh, and interesting. Mm -hmm.